Did you know, in Nazarick, there exists an elusive seventh member of the Pleiades, a young girl who, if you've only ever watched the anime, you probably weren't even aware of outside of the brief mentions in our previous videos. So today, we're going to talk about that young girl, that mysterious seventh sister, the final member of the Pleiades, Oriole Omega. It's understandable that you don't know who she is. After all, the brief clues and mentions of her have been cut almost entirely from the anime. Hell, even the light novel readers may not have been paying close enough attention to connect all the dots, but there are definitely plenty of scenes, clues, and references to piece together a decent amount of detail here. But before I get started, I wanted to let you guys know that we have launched a brand new merch design, one involving each of the Pleiades' six stars. You know, just to show some of the other NPCs some love. So, if you're interested in this design or the more original Succubae and Nabe designs, then feel free to check those out with the links in the description. Now, let's begin. Oriel Omega is the youngest and arguably most powerful member of the Pleiades. She's a human girl and one of the few non-heteromorphs of Nazarick. That being said, she's actually immortal, meaning she doesn't age, and so denizens of Nazarick typically don't consider her as an actual human. Well, it's because the majority of them despise humans and are resistant to the idea of them being allowed into Nazarick. Those that are aware of Oriel Omega's existence, such as her sisters or Albedo, will often correct themselves and point out that while they do hate most humans, Oriel Omega is a notable exception. So yeah, she's a character that's never appeared in the anime, but what's even more interesting is, in the novels, she's actually never appeared directly in any scene. I mean, Yuri Alpha did have a brief conversation with her via the message spell in one of the side stories, though that's really all there is. That said, other characters have made offhanded comments about her, which has helped to illuminate certain aspects of her personality and appearance. She's said to have the image of a Miko, meaning shrine maiden or priestess. She wears a white kimono-esque jacket called a Haori, and a pair of red trousers called a Hakuma. Traditionally speaking, Miko were seen as shaman and spiritualists, who would communicate with and or exercise spirits. A modern day Miko can be found attending to shrines, assisting in hosting cultural festivals, and participating in ceremonial dances. It's a position that's deeply rooted in the Japanese religion of Shintoism, a polytheistic one wherein the spiritual realm coexists with the physical world and kami, meaning divine spirits, manifest themselves in the natural world as rocks, trees, rivers, animals, places, and even people. There are said to be millions of different spirits, and every single one of them are personified, given a name, ascribed a personality, and even have relationships and interactions with other kami or spirits. It's these personified kami and yokai that often become the subject of Japanese entertainment media, as I'm sure you've already noticed with anime like Noragami or Uchoten Kazoku. As for Oriel Omega's personality, she's actually kind of nice. More specifically, she's been described as sensible, down to earth and rational, as well as gentle with an adorable smile and a cute laugh. Based on these descriptions and the Japanese shrine maiden trope, her character seems to be that of a Yamato Nadeshiko, the ideal woman. One that's gentle and supportive, but also competent and reliable. As much as I'd like to talk about her creator's motivation for designing her this way, that person's identity is even more mysterious than she is. So it's a bit difficult to speculate on what kind of influences her creator may have had with regards to any of this. As for her name though, as usual with Overlord characters, it has plenty of symbolic significance. Strictly speaking, Oriel is the word for the Ring of Golden Light found in many images of Christian saints. It's the holy glow that surrounds their entire body, effectively symbolizing that their personage has been touched by the divine, though it can also be used as a synonym for the halo around their heads. The word can also be used to describe the glow surrounding bright light sources, such as the sun, though I'm sure the former definition is much more applicable to Oriel Omega's character. So though she's more connected to western religions rather than eastern ones, it may serve to reinforce Oriel's connection to the spiritual as a Miko priestess as if to imply that she's blessed with divine powers. Maybe it's even to evoke the sun as symbolic of her warm and radiant personality, or quite possibly both. Omega, on the other hand, is the final letter of the Greek alphabet, marking her as the final, and therefore youngest, sister of the Pleiades, each of whom also have a Greek letter, which, if you didn't know, corresponds to their age. Alpha being first, 
Beta 2nd, Gamma 3rd, Epsilon 4th, Delta 5th, and Zeta 6th. So, as the youngest and most secretive member of the Pleiades, what exactly does she do? Well, within Nazarek, Oriel Omega is the area guardian of the Cherry Blossom Sanctuary. Now knowing the roots of her name and appearance, it makes sense that she would inhabit a traditional Japanese Shinto shrine. One that's surrounded by cherry blossoms, or more commonly known as sakura trees. They're the type that blooms in spring, and it's a popular Japanese pastime to visit shrines surrounded by such trees, in order to properly enjoy the scenery and the atmosphere. Unsurprisingly, the Cherry Blossom Sanctuary is also filled with various Yggdrasil monsters designed after mythological Japanese kami and yokai, and they serve to act as Oriel Omega's attendants and guards, two of which are mentioned specifically. There's Uka no Mitama, literally translating to the rice in storehouses, and then Otoshi, meaning New Year. They're a pairing of brother and sister in Shinto mythology, and are believed to be the kami of food, grains, agriculture, and harvest. They're often associated with Inari Okumi, the kami of foxes, agriculture, and prosperity, and one of the principal deities in Shintoism. Now, as individual creatures of Yggdrasil, Uka no Mitama is a level 85 monster that takes the appearance of a young woman in a fox mask, and she's adept at psychic magic and mental attacks. She also has a bestial form that sacrifices her spellcasting capabilities in exchange for greater physical power. I suspect it to be something reminiscent of a gigantic fox creature. As for Otoshi, his appearance is that of a young man in a sun motif mask. His abilities are likely related to his mythological counterpart, something along the lines of powers that complement his older sister's psychic attacks and bestial transformation. As of now, we know that there are multiple Ukonomitamas serving under Oreo, as well as at least one Otoshi, if not more, that act as servants and guards. As for the Cherry Blossom Sanctuary itself, it's actually located on the 8th floor of Nazarek. Little is known about the rest of the floor's makeup or characteristics, except that it is Nazarek's final defensive line in the case of an invasion, as well as the home of its most powerful guards. If you're wondering why, it's because many members of the guild Ainz Ugon were power gamers, min-maxers, and strategists, and they were really good at finding broken combinations of abilities that were borderline exploits. For the 8th floor, it's theorized that they basically put their heads together and came up with the most broken combos they could think of, piling them all together on a single floor. Victim is the floor guardian, and he has a selection of abilities or skills that allow him to sacrifice his own life in exchange for an extremely useful effect. It's theorized as a massive buff for allies or a debuff for enemies. This in combination with Rubedo, who is believed to be uncharacteristically powerful as a result of having been created via the use of a world item, as well as the other powerful monsters on the floor, possibly even including Oriel Omega herself, the guild was once able to fend off the invasion of an 8 guild alliance. So yeah, the 8th floor is pretty stacked, but shifting our focus back to Oriel herself now, she has three main responsibilities as a denizen of Nazarek. First, she is the leader of the Pleiades Seven Sisters, of which normally Sibas would be in command, and the group is then known as the Pleiades Six Stars. But if Sibas is unable to lead, Oriel Omega's guidance is then needed, or the Pleiades are then required to assist Oriel in one of her other responsibilities. Either way, the Pleiades can be assigned to follow her command instead. This could very well have been nothing more than a random fact written in her bio somewhere. I mean, initially, when everything was just a game in Yggdrasil, Oriel Omega was just an NPC sitting around on the 8th floor. The guild members had no real way of getting the Pleiades, a bunch of mindless NPCs who were only capable of following basic movement instructions or AI scripts, to actually follow her command. The best that they could probably do was drag the Pleiades all the way down to the 8th floor, or drag Oriel Omega all the way up to the 10th floor and then have them stand next to each other so that they were able to fight enemies together. Still though, the guild members did enjoy opportunities to roleplay. Perhaps their true intent was to have Oriel Omega be the leader of the Pleiades, with Sibas just as her second in command, but instead they decided against it and agreed that her powers were better utilized protecting the 8th floor. Or perhaps the person that created her also created the Cherry Blossom Sanctuary, kind of like their own little private pet project and they simply declared somewhere in her bio that she was a Pleiades too, as well as included the minor detail that she could act as their alternate leader, but without consulting or asking for permission from the creators of the other members. Who knows? Oriel's second major responsibility is to monitor the teleportation network of Nazarek and intercept any enemies. Normally, teleportation spells into, through, or out of Nazarek are blocked by various spells that prevent anyone without a Ring of Ainz or Gon from doing so, 
and the ring itself also has the appropriate teleportation magic to allow even the non-spellcasting guild members to quickly and efficiently move through Nazarick. After all, its floors were practically miniature dimensions in and of themselves, spanning miles in some cases, and so efficient traversal would be really important to the guild members. As a matter of fact, going from one floor to another might actually require some kind of interdimensional teleportation, almost as if the floors were separate level instances, and traversing between one and the other required a loading screen. This is part of the reason why Ainz gives many of the Guardians the rings back, and why he also orders the Guardians to not take the rings with them outside of Nazarick. For them to accidentally fall into the wrong hands would allow a back door into almost any location in Nazarick, including even the treasury, bypassing any defenses in the process. Those without a ring who attempted to teleport into Nazarick would be blocked, or even worse, they could have their destination redirected into a particularly dangerous powerful trap or ambush. Of course, ostensibly you could make traversing Nazarick impossible without these rings, blocking any transportation using defensive spells and sealing up the major connections between floors to prevent traversal on foot. But the developers of Yggdrasil wanted to encourage guild versus guild combat, and they didn't want guilds building impenetrable fortresses that could never be invaded. So, in order to prevent this, they developed an advanced algorithm called the Ariadne system. It would meticulously map every guild layout submitted to the server, in order to ensure that at least one continuous path existed from the entrance of the guild all the way to its heart, aka the throne room, at all times. Presumably, defeating all defenders and occupying this location uncontested would grant the invaders ownership over the dungeon, booting Ainz Ulgon out in the process. Furthermore, there were other restrictions, such as the total length of the path and so on. Any guild base that failed to adhere to these rules would be repeatedly penalized with extremely high fees each day and quickly go bankrupt. So what did Ainz and the rest do to meet these strict guild layout guidelines? Well, it's actually quite impressive. You see, Nazarek also includes a separate teleportation network, comprised of a series of connected permanent gate spells, and each linked to a different point of the tomb. It's a network that allows any individual, even those without spellcasting powers, the ability to traverse the entirety of Nazarek on foot, even without a ring of Ainz Ulgon. The end result is a complex pathway that leads all the way to the throne room, and it fits within the rules demanded by the Ariadne system. But here's where they kind of cheat the system. They also set up the ability for someone, such as a guild member, or now Oriel Omega, to monitor this teleportation network. And when I say monitor, I mean she can redirect the destination of any individual who is attempting to use the gate spells. The way it worked is that so long as a single continuous path still existed to the heart of the dungeon, this was okay. For instance, there could be four different gates spread across the entirety of the first floor of Nazarick, each of which would normally lead to a specific destination on the second floor. That being said, the guild would be able to have any three of them at any given time redirect people into traps or ambushes, so long as the fourth and final one still allowed that normal progression to the second floor. A small group of invaders could potentially be trolled repeatedly, as each gate they attempt to enter could have its destination swapped at the last second, redirecting them into a continuous non-stop path of traps instead. Even invaders who knew exactly how the scheme worked would still be forced to split into even groups and coordinate over long distances to enter all gates simultaneously. This meant that only one of the groups would make it through while the rest would be sent back to a previous floor and have their time wasted, or potentially moved to a later floor and cut off from reinforcements. That being said, it's implied that the redirection trap isn't nearly quite as sophisticated as this. It could very well be that there may only be a single destination that Oriel can redirect them all to. So it may only be effective for smaller groups or individuals, and not sufficient to stop an organized army. It really just depends on how you interpret the rather vague wording that the Light Novel uses. A lot of specifics and details as to the exact mechanisms are lacking. It's also probably against the Ariadne system rules to teleport people into a place that they can't escape from. So ultimately, if they manage to survive whatever trap or ambush that lies in wait for them, they can still press on. It's also implied that the monitoring and redirection capability does not extend to those teleporting using the Ring of Ainz or Gom. After all, it wouldn't make sense that Ainz would be so paranoid about the rings falling into the wrong hands if the person monitoring the teleportation network could deal with any intruders in the same manner. In any case, a similar scheme to the aforementioned defense is demonstrated repeatedly during the workers' invasion of Nazarick, though in that scenario they used teleportation traps instead of gates. Anyway, 
Presumably, the monitoring spells allow one to know who is moving through what gates, though it's not clear how much information Oriel is provided. Various divination spells exist which allow you to know information about an area or foe, such as detect life or detect magic, both telling if there are any living creatures or active magic spells in a specific area. There are also spells to view statistical information, such as an enemy's HP or MP. I assume advanced divination spells also exist, which can provide more detailed information, such as race, name, stats, equipment, and so on, or even ones that act as spy cameras in order to secretly view an area. These would be especially helpful in allowing Oriole to carefully examine anyone using the teleportation gates. But to summarize everything that we just talked about, as the dedicated monitor of the teleportation network, Oriel Omega is pretty much Nazarek's security guard, or literal gatekeeper, sitting in her little security hub with camera feeds pointing to every gate location in Nazarek. Personally, our headcanon is that Oriel Omega sends message spells to anyone approaching the gates of Nazarek, asking them to present their identification or state the purpose of their visit, sort of like those security guards that you see in movies who man the entrances of a secure base over an intercom. In actuality though, she's fairly quiet and keeps to herself, unless she notices an oddity or an unauthorized user, which is why her appearances are so far and few between. Okay, now this may seem like an abrupt stop, but I'm going to end it here before moving on to her final and most important duty, as well as her build. The reason being that if I go any further, I won't have enough time to get this video out in a timely manner. Hopefully part 2 won't be far behind, and since I'm also in the middle of the shelter videos, you already know that there's plenty more Overlord content to come. Anyway, before I go, don't forget you can buy the new merch designs from the link in the description. Now, as always, thank you so much for watching, and if you enjoyed this type of anime content, then you already know what to do. So, until next time, ciao!